Well, good morning, yeah. and uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction, and, and thanks to the organizers of the symposium and uh, the host here for this invitation. Uh, my first time visiting Zagreb was several years ago for a hip hop program, and I've been uh, looking to uh, hoping to come back, and uh, I was delighted to get an invitation to uh, come talk about an earlier part of the, uh, the recording industry. Uh, so I'm just really pleased and honored to be here and uh, to speak with you. Okay, let's go. No, Do I need it? No, <laughs> thank you. Okay, so to review the program for 78 at Home, Local Perspectives on the Early Reporting Industry, is to be humbled by the vast experience and depth of knowledge assembled at this symposium. For example, here are the countries represented on the program in terms of the speakers and their subjects. Australia, Austria, Belgium, Brazil, Bosnia, Canada, China, Czechia, Croatia, England, Finland, Germany, Hungary, India, Italy, Malaysia, Montenegro, Mozambique, New Zealand, Papua New Guinea, Poland, Portugal, Romania, Serbia, Slovenia, South Africa, Sweden, Ukraine, and the United States. Um, I'm sure I missed some, but, uh, but just that is incredibly impressive uh, in terms of its breadth. And the papers cover an impressive array of, uh, of topics from archival practices to folklore to politics to religion. And they explore a variety of genres, classical music, folk music, jazz, sacred music, spoken word, theater, and a variety of popular and dance music forms. So given the richness and diversity of the presentations to come, I decided that I could best complement the program by offering a broad context for thinking about one of the central symbols and objects of the early recording industry, which is the 78 RPM record. As you'll notice, as you will notice, uh, my talk, my examples are largely drawn from the United States. Fortunately, as the program suggests, we are in no danger of too narrow and geographical focus. Still, in the discussion following, I invite you to suggest ways in which the topics I've discussed can be applied to other countries, regions, and cultures. So among the many, many ways to think about the 78, I offer seven or eight, depending on how you count. I will devote one brief section of my talk to each of the following topics, art, community, documentation, diaspora, disability, empire, environment, noise, and performance practice. And by the way, this has changed a little bit uh, since the ad -term. At the end of each section, I'll either point to further research or offer what I hope are some productive questions worth pursuing. The goal of this talk is to reinforce and build upon the themes that will be articulated over the symposium's four days. And in doing so, I want to assert the continued relevance and vitality of the early recording industry as a subject of scholarly discourse and an object of broad public interest. One quick note before I continue. In focusing on the 78, I didn't mean to suggest that cylinders and other recording formats are less significant or what we've studied. In fact, much of what I will discuss also applies to cylinders and to early uh, recording and playback machines as well. I'm using the 78 as a synecdoche, a stand-in for and symbol of the enterprise of sound recording in the 70 or so years following the introduction of the photograph. Ah, okay. So the 78 RPM record is a functional object, a format and a storage unit, but it is also an art object. I mean this in several ways. For one, we may admire its visual and material qualities aesthetically rather than functionally. A 78 is a compelling arrangement of shapes, colors, and lines. A small circle, the center hole, is surrounded by a larger circle, the label, which sits within this, the circle of the disc as a whole. A seemingly undifferentiated surface res, re, uh, resolves into a pattern of tiny grooves collected in bands that reflect light differently depending on how you hold the disc in your hands, angling it this way and that. And of course, there is the, the feel, uh, even the smell of recordings that it, uh, the 78, it's a multi-sensory art object. 
And I suspect that many of you, like I have, have just sat and contemplated uh, these uh, these 78s, these uh, discs as uh, as an as a work of art and not just as a uh, recording medium. So 78s and the machines that play them have also been the subject of many artists over the decades. Um, so on, uh, on this slide, there are two paintings, Henri Matisse's interior with the phonograph from 1924 and Rene Magritte's The Menace Assassin from 1927. Although different in many ways, both feature slightly outdated external horn photographs with accompanying discs whose presence is rather mysterious. Why did Matisse place the machine at the edge of the frame? What is its relationship to the still life, the arrangement of fruit and flowers, uh, that is the focus of the painting? The Greek painting piece was inspired by a 1912 film that was itself based on a set of detective novels. In the film, the assassin listens to a recording of the cries of the woman he has just murdered. Both paintings depict the 78 RPM record as an artifact that preserves traces of human presence. Matisse's disc suggests that the room was recently occupied, full of music and sound. Magritte's disc suggests that the room was recent. Uh, sorry, Magritte's disc captures moments of dying and death. Both seem to play with the concept of the still life, the French term for which is not to mort or dead nature. So I've just mentioned two paintings, but there's so much more to explore, both from the time of the 78 and from more recent times, when the 78 is often regarded as an object of nostalgia. Another way in which the 78 RPM record has acted as an art object is through advertising. You are all probably familiar with, uh, with some of the uh, images of records and the machines that have great marketing campaigns since the end of the 19th century. Um, what I did in preparing for this talk was I spent hours scrolling through ads on the site Pinterest. It turns out to be a, a useful uh, site for, uh, for research uh, that uh, I had not uh, previously considered. Um, and I found so many um, images uh, from um, of early recording um, ads, and I will uh, I will show a few. I'll uh, describe them briefly. Um, we have uh, basically uh, many of them uh, show the discs um, in various artistic features. But one thing that's very interesting and common is that they uh, show discs and people. So. Uh, we have one where there are people dancing on the disc. There are ones uh, with the silhouettes um, uh, on discs. Um, we have a woman contemplating a record. We have birds listening to a phonograph. We have a man and a woman dancing in front of a disc. Uh, and uh, these ones, and I'm uh, uh, thinking about uh, International Women's Day, um, I'll be talking about this in a moment, about uh, how many of these early um, ads feature women and records, women holding records, women standing next to records. Um, there's uh, something to be said and critiqued about all these images. These as well, two women um, contemplating uh, records um, almost uh, sensually. So I'm not aware of much scholarship on the commercial art of the early recording industry, but it is a ripe area for further exploration. And I haven't even mentioned the picture bits in which images are pressed into the record itself. I'll show you an image of several Vogue picture records, which were produced by the Saveway Industries Company in Detroit in 1946 and 1947. So for just one area of inquiry I would mention, it would be worth studying how women are depicted as objects of desire next to the records themselves. The objectification of women, alas, is an old and familiar topic, but what might a study of the coupling of women and discs as objects tell us about how marketing strategies in the recording industry tap into and reinforce gender norms? And I'll leave you with a broader question about the 78 as art. How has the treatment of the disc as an art object changed over time? And how do shifts in its aesthetic perception reflect changes in our understanding of the technology? 
Now I move on to the section of catalyst slash document. Of all the topics that I will cover in my talk, the subject of reporting as catalyst is the one I've thought about for the longest, more than 32 years now. In fact, I remember the exact day that it occurred to me that sound recording does not just preserve music, but also influences the way that it is created and experienced. <laughs> it was August 12, 1990. I know that because it was the day I read an article in the New York Times by Will Crutchfield called Historical Violin Styles, Myth and Reality. And here's an, uh, an image of, uh, of that, um, that article, which I still have a clipping of in my class. Uh, that was probably also the day I became a musicologist or started to think like one. Crutchfield was reviewing an anthology uh, from Pearl Records uh, of historical violin recordings uh, that were reissued on CD. And with this set, it was now possible to easily study and compare violin recordings made from the early part of the 20th century. What particularly struck me about the article was the section called The Gramophone as Catalyst. Crutchfield discusses the changes in violin performance practice that are revealed on these recordings and suggests that, quote, it may well be that the primitive gramophone itself hastened these changes along. This speculative statement had a profound effect on it. I set out to discover what it might mean that a device intended to preserve a performance practice could instigate changes in performance practice as well. And when I read this, I was uh, I was an undergraduate college student. I ended up writing a uh, an undergraduate thesis called "The Interaction of Violin Playing with Recording Technology in the Recording Industry, 1890 to 1940." Uh, that was from 1992, and that became part of my 1999 dissertation, which was called "The Phonograph Effect: The Influence of Recording on Listener, Performer, and Composer." And then I revised that into my 2004 book, Capture of Sound, which I then revised and now I'm revising again. So in other words, I've gotten a lot of violence out of this one idea. And as far as I'm concerned, it's an idea that we can keep exploring endlessly. I propose the term phonograph effect to describe manifestations of sound recording, sound recording's influence. But I've written about a variety of examples, including the practice of solitary listening, the composition of pieces designed to fit the time limitation of the 78 RPM record, changes in the instrumentation of jazz ensembles, and, uh, and the increase of uh, vibrato use in violinists, classical violinists in particular. So rather than discuss any of these examples further, since I've already discussed them before, uh, I'll close this section by pointing to some exciting um, new research that considers the catalytic nature of the 70 RPM record and sound recording in general. And uh, this is uh, coming out of the uh, research network called Redefining Early Recordings as Sources for Performance Practice and History, funded by the British Arts and Humanities Research Council and led by Eva Moreira Rodriguez and Inya Stanovic. In three symposia held over the past few years, scholars have presented fascinating evidence that shows how performers recording in the early 20th century adjusted aspects of their performance in response to the technology. One important methodological approach has been to make modern recordings using century old technology. And I'm pleased that Dr. Stanovich will be presenting the research at this symposium. As she points out in the abstract of her talk, we still don't know, quote, the extent to which performing musicians adapted their practice when recording with mechanical technologies. However, this research promises to expand our understanding of this important subject. One of the fascinating aspects of the catalytic nature of sound recording is that the technology also serves as a preservational tool and has long been understood as an invaluable document of musical traditions and performance practice. Although there is a tension between the understanding of the SEBI as catalyst and as document, the two are not mutually exclusive. We're aware that performers, whether speakers or musicians, had to adjust their delivery and performance to accommodate the particularities of the technology. We can glean valuable historical information. The title of a 2014 article by the epimusicologist and scholar of the early recording industry, Pekka Gurma, captures that value. It's called The World's Greatest Archive, 78 RPM Records as a Source for Musicological Research. Indeed, one of the major themes of this symposium 
is recorded sound as document. And I look forward to learning a great deal from this exciting research. My next section is called community. So several of the papers in this symposium engage the subject of community, examining, for example, communal listening in New Zealand, record collections among the Ukrainian diaspora in Nova Scotia, Canada, and audio theater among immigrant communities in the United States. Given that music, theater, and conversation have always been embedded within communities, the study of the relationship between recording technology and community is a significant one. When we study that relationship, we are not only examining the particularities of the group's dynamics, but are we, we are asking important questions about the socio-cultural impact of the technology and the fundamental need, human need, for a connection. In this section, I'd like to consider the subject of the phonograph in rural communities in the United States in the early 20th century. Music educators in the 1910s and 1920s often expressed their full-throated embrace of the phonograph as a means to educate children in rural communities. A. E. Winship, the editor of the Journal of Education, invoked the almighty in praising the machine in 1916. I yield to no one in my appreciation of the rural mail service and of the rural telephone, but I place above either and both of them in the service of God and humanity, the possibilities of the instrument which will evermore thrill country life with the richest music of the greatest masters. So elsewhere, I've written about the role of the phonograph in U.S. music education. But I'd like to take this opportunity to consider the relationship between the recording industry and rural communities in the United States. In June 1919, an article in the journal Music Trades identified a lucrative new market for phonographs and records, farmers, calling the U.S. rural population a golden opportunity for finding new customers. It stated the following. 50,000 talking machines will be sold to farmers of Kansas during the next year, in the opinion of music dealers throughout the state. This estimate has to do with the farmers alone, and people live, living in towns and cities are not figured in. Kansas is 90% an agricultural state, and agriculture this year is better than gold mining. Music dealers in all parts of the state are viewing this situation with a great deal of interest, and they are busy figuring out the effect it will have on their businesses. Indications are that the music business will be unusually prosperous during the coming 12 months at least, and it is probable that the increase in sales volumes, sales volume will continue even after that period. Indeed, the industry put a good deal of energy into marketing its products to rural communities in the U.S. The Victor Talking Machine Company was especially active in promoting its, school, its business to rural schools, publishing Booklets that acted as catalogs, like the Victrola in Rural Schools, first published in 1916. A 1920 article in Talking Machine World explained how the Columbia Graphophone Company was developing new road signs as part of a campaign to appeal to rural customers. They were intended to be tacked up, this is a quote, tacked up on old barns, sheds, and fences so as to draw people to the nearest dealer. And I have an image from uh, the an article from Talking Machine World uh, called the Columbia Company Prepares Road Sign for Dealer's Use. And there's an image of uh, of a couple in a car driving by a bar and looking at a uh, Columbia ad. So I find this fascinating. I'd love to actually see some of these uh, some of these advertisements. I, though I'm sure that very few still exist. Another way in which the U.S. recording industry engaged with rural communities was to create discs made to accompany group singing, often called community sings, for groups that did not have the means to provide instrumental accompaniment. A 1921 booklet called Rural and Small Community Recreation, Suggestions for Utilizing the Resources of Rural Communities, explained the value of such records. In rural gatherings where there is no piano or organ, or where there is no player for these instruments, the, the problem of providing an accompaniment for the group singing may be solved through the use of mechanical instruments. Certain of the talking machine companies have lately prepared special records in which band accompaniment is given for, this, for special community songs and in keys suitable for community singing. 
These are arranged so that a group in the church club or home merely gathers around the machine and sings to the phonographic company. Inquiries regarding such records may be made of the Victor Talking Machine Company, Camden, New Jersey, or the Columbia Graphophone Company, New York City. These tidbits offer just a taste of the wealth of information available about the relationship between the industry and U.S. rural communities. Anyone who is interested in digging further can explore the digitally preserved issues of Talking Machine World on the website World History worldradiohistory.com and find literally hundreds of relevant articles. There is still so much more to be understood about the industry, uh, how the industry engaged with urban and rural customers in distinctive ways, both in the United States and throughout the world. <clears throat> Fortunately, at least two upcoming talks, one that focuses on the US and one on Brazil, will explore these distinctions. My next section is diaspora. We now want to move from rural communities to urban ones. Specifically, I'd like to consider the role of the phonograph in urban immigrant communities. Phonographs and 78 RPM records held great appeal to diaspora communities around the world. And the recording industry put much energy into producing recordings and marketing records and machines to those communities. It's easy to understand why. Music is a powerful connector to one's homeland, its art, culture, and language. And recordings, portable and repeatable, facilitated that connection in distinctive ways. Countless recordings were made of popular and traditional music of scores of different ethnic groups. Listening to, singing with, and dancing to these recordings facilitated connections not only to the homeland, but to other communities, or but, uh, but to other communities as well, both within the ethnic group and between groups. The records also connected immigrants with members of the majority population, whether in schools or community events, or with phonograph and record viewers. This is a topic that has been of great interest to scholars for decades, and scholarly work has not abated at all. Several papers in the coming days will probe much deeper than I will now. In light of this, I want to share just a single facet of the subject of sound recording and the diaspora, one that I hadn't encountered before preparing this lecture. I will quote from an unlikely source, 1915 report by the New York State Department of Labor. The subject is an unfortunate one, the exploitation of immigrants by so-called phonograph swindlers. Here's an excerpt from the report. One of the most prolific sources of swindling immigrants and aliens is the phonograph mail order business, a lucrative and highly organized mode of extracting money from the unsuspecting through the medium of the foreign press. Advertisements are inserted in various languages, stating that on payment of $5 and an agreement to pay the balance in small installments, a machine will immediately be forwarded to the purchaser, quote, with records of your national songs in your own tongue. On receiving the initial payment, the phonograph company forwards a machine by express with the entire balance to be collected COD, cash on delivery. When the alien is notified by the express company, he is shocked at the mistake and protests to the phonograph concern with the result that this company retains both the machine and the original payment. The immigrant being helpless and unfamiliar with either the language or usage of the country, usage of the country, thus, uh, loses his hard-earned money and his remonstrance remains unheeded. Whatever you call them, cons, scams, swindles, fraudulent business practices succeed because they ex identify and exploit desire. The phonograph swindlers were reprehensible, but they also serve as additional evidence in our understanding of the relationship between diaspora communities and the early recording industry. The next section is on disability. Thomas Edison's hearing impairment is well known, and anecdotes abound about his, how his disability affected his work with sound report. For example, he was known to bite down on the wooden case of a piano to sense the vibrations coming from the pianist's playing. He would then judge the quality of the playing based on what was a, for, what was a form of bone conduction. Perhaps less well known is that the phonograph was touted as a means for curing deafness in the 20th century. 
I must admit that I've never really taken these facts as anything more than quirks of Edison's personality and of quackery on the part of pseudoscientists. But it's worth looking deeper into the connection between disability and the early recording technology. This is not to say that the subject has been neglected, and I'm looking forward to hearing a paper by Nikola Zekic about line collectors of 78 RPM discs. In this section, I'd like to highlight the potential for exploring this topic further by citing some of the 20th, early 20th century sources that link disability here in the form of mobility limitations to sound recording. The first source is a 1902 memoir by an American woman named Belle Atkinson. It is called The Sunny Side of a Shut-In's Life. It describes the experiences of a woman whose disability left her confined to her bedroom. In one passage, she describes how some of her friends threw a phonograph party by bringing a machine and some records to her home to play for her. Her description is brief, but it communicates how the portability of records and record players could benefit those with limited mobility or who were otherwise too ill to go to live concerts. I want to tell you, this is a quote from, uh, from one of her letters, I want to tell you of the photograph party some of our friends gave in my honor. A friend from Perrysville Avenue brought her photograph. A number of friends came and ere the evening was over, a whole kindergarten collected and we had an enjoyable time. For those who can attend concerts, theaters, musicals, etc., a photograph is not much of a treat, but I enjoyed it. Then my dear little friend Jenny Neely came in and danced the cakewalk, sang and recited. This is just one of several sources I found that discuss how the photograph could serve those who are isolated by their disability, at this time often described by the term shut in. Um, I'll show you some more sources. Um, one, for example, is from a 1913 article in the Edison Phonograph Monthly that suggests that people who cannot physically attend church can be served by bringing phonographs with recorded sermons and religious music to their homes. The article mentions, uh, the article mentions that a church in Connecticut was doing just that. Another example comes from a 1915 issue of a journal for pharmacists which says that, quote, among those who are likely to be a good phonograph customers are chronic invalids and those who are shut in because of their ill health. An interesting aspect of these two items is that they are directed at phonograph and record dealers and suggest untapped uses and markets for their records. These items also remind us that although the recording industry was driven by profit, Many people within the industry also sought to do good and serve others in their marketing and sales practices. And by the way, um, I'm happy to, if anyone wants to follow up with me, I'm happy to give you citations or just send you PDFs. Uh, so uh, feel free to get in touch if any of the, uh, any of the sources I mentioned uh, pique your interest. I'd like to move on to talk about 78 RPM record and empire. As several papers in this symposium will test, the history of the early recording industry is tied up with the history of colonialism and imperialism. In fact, this could be the subject of an entire symposium. There is so much to say about how recordings as bearers of culture have served as instruments of empire, and by contrast, how they can serve decolonization projects. In all cases, the 78 RPM record is a symbol of power in asymmetrical power relationships. The 78 can thus be an object of oppression and assimilation or an object of resistance and self-determination. I'd like to add to the ongoing conversation about 78 RPM records and empire by talking briefly about how Western, Western Christian missionaries embrace recordings as a tool for spreading the gospel and as part of a broader civilizing project. To do this, I will share a few passages written in praise of the phonograph by or about late 19th century and early 20th century missionaries. My first example comes from A.Y. Smith of Louisville, Kentucky, who wrote the following in a letter to the editor of the journal Missionary Review of the World in 1894. It 
it will be conceded that it is of the utmost importance that the scriptures be placed in the hands of the heathen. There is great difficulty connected with the case. Science has right here given us a means of overcoming this difficulty. Though it takes long study for a person to learn a written language, anyone, however ignorant, can understand his own tongue by hearing it spoken. This science has enabled us to produce. I refer to the phonograph. If missionaries or heathen converts were to speak the scriptures into a machine, it would repeat it right back, and the most ignorant could understand. Uh, oh, maybe I skipped a little bit. Sorry. Um, many would listen to a talking machine who would not otherwise hear a person read. Then, in many Eastern countries, women are kept secluded from the gaze of men, and it is not considered reputable for women and men to be together, or women to be seen in the presence of men. The phonograph would come in right here. It could also be taken into the privacy of the Asiatic home, where a man could not. Then it would no doubt be cheaper than sending a person to a place for the purpose, and would receive attention where a person would not. Of course, photographs and wax tablets would cost money, but so do missionaries and written scriptures. Nevertheless, it is probable that it would amply repay any expense. Two or three families could listen to one photograph, or a few could be kept in a church or chapel for anyone to come and listen to. From these and, these and other reasons that will readily suggest themselves to you, I think you will perceive the immense advantage that will accrue from the use of the phonograph in foreign countries to disseminate a knowledge of the scriptures. You, of course, understand that the Protestant Christians form a very small proportion of the population of the world. Hence, it will take a great deal of expense and effort to evangelize the human race by the usual means. My second excerpt comes from a 1911 book called The Relation of Science to Christian Missions. <clears throat> The native savage, attracted and impressed by a magnet, watch, or gramophone, is often the more willing to listen to the missionary's message. A third example comes from the 1928 book, The Consumption of Wealth. This was written not by a missionary, but by an American professor of economics. And this is what she wrote. The element of missionary zeal and endeavor in connection with religion has been of considerable importance in diffusing culture and at some times in some places. For the missionary brings with him not only his religious beliefs, but his schools, his literature, his art, and to a large extent, his material interests. The various Christian mission posts scattered all over the world have considerable cultural influence today. In many a grass hut in the Congo, dark-skinned babies are submitting to comb, brush, and soap in their anticipation of going to a phonograph party at a mission station. So I imagine that these statements strike you as repugnant in their racism, their arrogance, and disregard for the agency and self-determination of others. And certainly, I read these. Uh, it, I have to say I wasn't surprised, but still kind of shocked at how how blatant the uh, the racism is. Um, and it's also repugnant how self-evident it is to the authors that the phonograph both can and should be exploited as a distinctively effective tool to subjugate others in the exercise of spreading their religious convictions. And in doing so, the missionaries themselves were a tool of empire, perhaps knowingly and enthusiastically, or perhaps not. The relationship between sound recording, missionary work, and empire in the 19th century and late 19th and early 20th century seems ripe for further research and perhaps can be part of contemporary decolonization efforts. And this is one of the things in preparing for this talk that I came across that I had uh, no knowledge of before and uh, was fascinated and discussed it at the same time. My next section is on the environment. I want to begin this section on the environment with a clip from a 1942 film produced by RCA Records called How Shellac Records Are Made. It's a fascinating film that explains the long and complex process by which 78 RPM records were created. The part I want to watch concerns the raw materials that go into creating the disc.
But before going to the actual pressing of records, I was shown the mixing of the materials that go into the disc you hear at home. Ingredients gathered from the farthest corners of the earth. The materials are processed in one of the largest and most intricate machines I have ever seen, the Banbury Mixer. One ingredient is the finest shellac obtainable, which is brought from India. Another resin ingredient is from the East Indies and, like the shellac, is ground into fine powder before mixing. Eighteen other ingredients gathered from distant places are carefully and accurately weighed in to ensure the most exact proportions to make a correct final mixture. All ingredients are finely ground and put into the mixer to be carefully combined under heat with the powdered shellac, which is sucked into the machine through a vacuum pipe. Now all is ready, and the Banbury mixer rolls. And um, so the images that we're seeing are uh, people shoveling raw ingredients, the black shellac materials, and lighter powder, and some huge industrial machines. I want to focus on the narrator's remarks at the beginning of the excerpt, and I'll just repeat, uh, repeat some of his remarks. Quote, I was shown the mixing of the materials that go into the discs you hear at home, ingredients gathered from the farthest corners of the earth. The materials are processed in one of the largest and most intricate machines I have ever seen, the Banbury mixer. One ingredient is the finest shellac obtainable, brought from India. Another resin ingredient is from the East Indies. 18 other ingredients gathered from distant places are carefully and accurately weighed in to ensure the most exact proportions to make a correct final mixture. So note the pride and even awe in which the narrator notes how the materials come from around the world and are combined in a massive industrial machine. It is indeed impressive, but note also the formidable environmental cost and toll of this manufacturing process. Countless tons of raw material were extracted from far-flung places, transported thousands of miles on massive ships, mixed in an energy-consuming process with waste and pollution produced at each step along the way. If we just consider shellac itself, only one of the materials used to make 78 RPM records, we get a sense of the environmental impact of the discs that we love so much. Shellac is a resinous material secreted by the black beetle, native to India and other parts of South Asia. I'll show you some images from a 1909 book about shellac of the beetle in different forms, male and female, healthy and unhealthy, and dead, winged, and wingless. So there are some images of various beetles and uh, beetles on a stick. Um, this is from a 1909 uh, book. Um, and uh, I'll uh, go to another, another piece, a 1942 article called India's Indus Industrial Insects, which captures the contributions of the black beetle to the world's industry and culture. Billions of, ins billions of insects and millions of trees and man hours of labor make possible this material, a brittle natural resin. In varying forms, it is sometimes used in watches, for making codes to pr protect planes and bombs, and for instruments of navigation. Shellac is a base for the fine sealing wax on which is impressed the country's coat of arms when treatises are signed. Should a national proclamation accompany initially another pact, very probably the president's words would be recorded for posterity on discs made of shellac compound. Adapted to hundreds of uses, shellac is employed most extensively in making phonograph records. About one third of the tonnage imported by us in recent years has been used in record manufacturing so that junior may jive and grandma may enjoy the melodies of Stephen Foster. 
So consider the death and removal of innumerable insects and trees and the erosion and pollution that accompanied such extraction. Consider the energy cost of transportation across oceans and manufacturing at a massive scale. Consider the attendant human toll, particularly in the colonized areas where the raw materials originate. The environmental impact of recorded sound has gotten more attention in recent years, and uh, many of you may know uh, Kyle Devine's book, 2019, Decomposed the Political Ecology of Music. That's one, one of uh, a number of uh, new pieces of research in this area. And I would identify this as a very important development in the scholarship on the early recorded industry. Our acknowledgement of the environmental toll of the 78 RPM records should prompt continued study and reflection. And I have some questions to, uh, to leave you with and the answers I do not have, unfortunately. How should our awareness of this environmental exploitation and degradation affect the way we tell the history of this industry? Should we look upon and interact with our 78s differently with this knowledge? How is the environmental impact of the industry tied up with imperialism and colonization? How might our understanding of this aspect of the industry's history inform our current and future engagement with the technologies of recorded sound? Now moving on to the final section of my talk on noise. So noise is usually defined as any unwanted or extraneous sound. Typically, when we engage with noise, it is to avoid it, complain about it, or try to reduce or eliminate it. But noise has an undeservedly bad reputation and is more complex than simply unwanted sound. Noise can be informationally rich and enhance our understanding and enjoyment of music. The sharp intake of breath can intensify a vocal line. The clicking of saxophone keys offers clues about the mechanics of the instrument. The whack of a plucked metal string against the wooden fingerboard of a double bass conveys its materiality and the effort of its flavor. These noises also help listeners distinguish one instrument from another, especially when we listen to recordings. When we cannot see the source of the sound, noises can flesh out the music disembodied by the medium. Every recording and playback medium has its own characteristic set of noises as well. And this, of course, includes the 78. We can tell the difference between the noises made by cylinders, 78s, LPs, and 45s. And I'm sure many of you can tell the difference between the noise made by different types of needles playing on 78s. Probably some of you can tell the difference between the sound of diamond discs and Victor records and, and so on. Now, even if we prefer rather less than more surface noise, I believe that all of us who love 78s love them in part because of the distinctive noises generated in their playback. The noise that accompanies the playing of a 78 tells us that we are listening to the distant past, acting as a kind of time machine that can transport us back a century or more. Some of us may even enjoy that sound aesthetically, perhaps finding it warm and comforting, the sonic equivalent of sitting in front of a cozy fireplace. I'd like to give some examples from the early 20th century that reveal both the negative and positive aspects of the 78 RPM record as noise. One of the consequences of the widespread adoption of the phonograph was the enactment of laws that regulated the playing of its recordings to certain times, places, and circumstances in order to reduce the sonic intrusion of recorded sound in the lives of others. Many such laws were enacted across the US in the first decades of the 20th century. An interesting document I came across in preparing for this lecture was a 1948 report called The Municipal Control of Noise by a group known as the National Institute of Municipal Law Officers, or NIMLA. These were mostly lawyers representing different municipalities. It's a useful document because it cites a variety of laws and court cases on the subject of noise control, many of them related to recorded sound. For example, it cites in the 1922 case, Stoddard versus Rosen Talking Machine Company. And I will read from, from a passage in this uh, booklet. The Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts affirmed a decree granting an injunction 
enjoining defendant from placing a phonograph in the doorway to his business and playing it so that it could be appreciably heard in plaintiff's business establishment located across a 36 foot wide street. The master in this case had found that the machine played from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m., that it was plainly audible in the plaintiff's premises, and that it wore on the nervous systems of plaintiff and his employees, producing headaches, rendering concentration on their work difficult, and diminishing their efficiency. Tragedy. So what's also informative about this source is that it provides templates for ordinances prohibiting, quote, unnecessary noises that cities and towns can adopt for their own use. So I'll, um, I'll show you um, a page from these templates, and uh, they're, they're really interesting because they have like um, the city of blank, you fill in the blank, ordains that uh, the making and creation of loud, unnecessary, or unusual noises within the limits of the city of blank, and so on. So all you need to do is fill, your, your, uh, fill in your city's name and adjust things. But um, I'll read one passage, um, which I've highlighted on the slide. The using, operating, or permitting to be played, used, or operated any radio receiving set, musical instrument, phonograph, or other machine or device for the producing or reproducing of sound in such manner as to disturb the peace, quiet, and comfort of the neighboring inhabitants or at any time with louder volume than is necessary for convenient hearing for the person or persons who are in the room, vehicle or chamber in which such machine or device is operated and who are voluntary listeners there too. I think that was one sentence. Uh, the operation of any such set, instrument, phonograph, machine, or device between the hours of 11 o'clock p.m. and 7 o'clock a.m. in such a manner as to be plainly audible at a distance of 50 feet from the building, structure, or vehicle in which it is located shall, prima facie, uh, shall be prima facie evidence of a violation of that section. And that is written in sort of classic, uh, you know, uh, legal jargon. Basically says, don't play, don't play your music so loud that someone across the street can hear. Uh, the phonograph is only one of just, uh, it's just one of 17 sources of loud, disturbing, and unnecessary noises that are um, identified in this booklet. And these include yelling and shouting, animals, steam whistlers, steam whistles, hawkers and peddlers, drums and street cars. From this perspective, photographs and records were both an integral component of the soundscape of early 20th century life, as well as a public nuisance to be regulated. For another perspective on 78s and noise, consider a 1943 publication called War in Music Plants. The purpose of the publication is to report on a study of factories that were manufacturing equipment for the US war effort. In particular, the researchers asked the question, well, can using music and war plants improve worker morale and, and production? Much of the music they referred to was played on phonograph records broadcast across a factory so that music would reach workers while they worked or during breaks or meals. One of the challenges of playing music in these settings is that the factories could be incredibly noisy. But one of the findings of this study was that music helped compensate for or counteract or even counteract the noise of the factory machinery. And I'll read to you a, a, uh, an excerpt from the report called Music in Noisy Departments. At first, many plants felt that they could not have music because their departments were too noisy. Then it was discovered that with proper engineering, even great noise could be overcome by music and that the effect of adding music to the machinery noise did not add to the total noise, but that the machinery noise somehow became the background for the music. After a trial, it was found that the workers in noisy departments appreciated the music fully as much as the workers in more quiet departments. The effect upon workers seemed good, and the response to questions shouted at them was, what the, was that they liked the music. Machinery noise in heavy industry manufacturing machine guns in Detroit was also observed to be fully overcome by music. So I just find that really interesting that music was, was helping the, the war effort um, and uh, also somehow doing battle with, with the war effort. The 70s RPM record was an active participant in the 20th century's two world wars. They accompanied soldiers to the front 
playing in barracks and trenches, entertaining them and connecting them to homes and loved ones. The 78 did the same for those on the home front. And in this case, 78s participated in America's war effort during World War II by counteracting the noise of the factories and helping essential workers with morale and efficiency. Clearly, noise is in the ear of the beholder. A 78 RPM record played at a loud volume can be deemed noise or it can defeat noise. Sometimes we struggle to reduce the noise of 78 RPM records, whether through rigorous cleaning or through the application of software programs. But in all cases, noise is worth, a, is worth our closer attention, for it can tell us a great deal about our beloved 78s and can, in fact, be part of why we love them so much. This has not been what I would call a thesis-driven lecture. I did not set out to present a new and deeply research area of I mean, central argument or intervention. Rather, inspired by the kind of subjects I encountered when reading the program for the symposium, I decided to do a bit of exploration. I considered the many ways in which we might think about the 78 RPM record and came up with a list of subjects that I wanted to explore further. I spent hours reading old documents and searching for mentions of rec recordings in unlikely places. I looked at and listened to rec records and record players, both online and in real life. I have two beautiful photographs, the 1916 Aeolian with the gradual attachment and a recently acquired Edison C250 diamond disc photograph from 1917 and 1918, and a modest collection of 78s. In other words, I had a lot of fun cutting this lecture together, even if it did take me a lot longer than I anticipated. It was a pleasure exploring unfamiliar aspects of the recording industry, and I learned a great deal in the process. And it is in this spirit of learning, sharing, and fun that I offer this lecture. We will be learning and sharing so much over the next few days, and I look forward with great enthusiasm to all that is to come. Thank you.